So we recently talked about function compositions, this new operation that we have where we can plug one function into another function. So when we say f of g of x, we're saying that x is the input of g, and then g is the input of f. And with inverses and their original function, they actually have a nice relationship. And let's see what that nice relationship is. So we have f of, we're saying f is the original, g of x is the inverse, f of g of x. And remember that g of x is, let's write this, f of x minus 1 over negative 2. So that's the input. So on the f function, whenever we see x, we're plugging in x minus 1 divided by negative 2. So this is equal to, let's write out the f function, negative 2 times the input plus 1. Again, this is always how we write the f function. Doesn't matter what the input is. In this case, the input is x minus 1 over negative 2. Well, so now let's simplify this and see what we get. Whenever we have a fraction and we're multiplying that fraction by its denominator, those denominators will cancel or they will divide out to 1. You can think of it as if we have negative 2 as negative 2 over 1. It's the same thing, but we now have negative 2 in the numerator, negative 2 in the denominator, and they're both factors or they're both multiplying. So we can divide these out and that becomes 1. So now this is just 1 over 1, which is just 1, times x minus 1. So what we have here is equal to x minus 1 plus 1 on the outside here. That's the leftover part. And if it helps us to think about this, this was the stuff that was in the parentheses. But now there's nothing else to do inside the parentheses, so we can just add that 1 into the parentheses and negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So we're just left with x. Huh, it's pretty nice. Let's take a look at what happens when we do it the other way, when we do g of f of x. So we're going to take f of x and plug it into g of x. So let's write this out. This is the same as saying g of the input is f of x. So let's write out what this looks like. It's g is the outside function. f of x is the input, which is negative 2x plus 1. So let's write out the g of x function and put a blank space for the x. So the g of x function is in the input. We leave a blank spot. So the x or the input minus 1 in the numerator divided by negative 2. And then the input in this case is the negative 2x plus 1. And so now order of operations tells us to do the parentheses first, but there's nothing to do in the parentheses because it, there's no combining like terms. So we have combined like terms of everything in the numerator. Well, we have plus 1 and then minus 1. Those add to 0. So let's say in the numerator we have negative 2x plus 0. So it's just negative 2x all divided by negative 2. Well, now here this is nice because we have negative 2 in the numerator, negative 2 in the denominator. Those divide to 1. And then we have left over just x again, which that's also really nice. So an observation you might be making here is that whenever we have a function in its inverse, when we do function compositions with them, we just end up with x. So the result was x, but think about why the result was x. And think about what the inverse function does. The inverse function undoes the processes that the original function does. So when you take an input, you multiply it by negative 2, and then you add 1 to it. But on the inverse, you do the opposite. You undo those processes. So then what you just end up with is what you started with. It's like taking two steps forward and then two steps back. You end up at the same spot as where you started. So let's say result is x because inverse undoes the original. And this is actually one way of proving or of showing analytically that a function is an inverse of another function, is by doing the function composition and seeing do we get x out. So let's take a look at this function here, fx is equal to the square root of x plus 5. 
we're restricting those values to x being greater than or equal to negative 5. And that's mostly because you can't plug in anything less than negative 5. Otherwise, you're going to be taking the square root of negative numbers. So the domain of this is all the numbers greater than or equal to negative 5. So greater than or equal to negative 5 is negative 5 to infinity. And then the range of this, there's a couple ways that we can think about it. We can think about what are all the possible outputs of this. We can also think about what the transformations are. Remember the square root function normally looks like this. It's a little bit more of a curve. My drawing skills aren't great today, but there's a little bit of a curve here and it starts at the zero here and then it slowly goes up to infinity forever. Think about it in terms of transformations, this function has a horizontal shifting to the left by five. So that's actually what this function looks like here. It shifts to the left by five. So here's negative five instead of starting at zero. So the range of this function is still the same as the original range of the square root function. The only difference is that it's just slid over to the left by five. So the range is from zero to infinity and we include zero. So let's find the equation for the inverse. We swap x and y, and then we solve for y. So swapping x and y, well, we have f of x here, but f of x is the same thing as y. So we have x is equal to the square root of y plus 5. And then now we want to solve for y. So we square both sides to cancel out that squared. We square both sides. And then we have x squared is equal to y plus 5. And then we subtract 5 to get y by itself. And then what we're left with on the function is y is equal to x squared minus 5. So let's keep in mind the original function here. Let's graph out the original function on our graph. And it's not going to be exact or perfect. So this is negative 5 here. And then the function, the square root of x plus 5 goes like this. And then the function x squared minus 5, let's take a look at that x squared minus 5. That's just like the regular squared function, but just shifted down 5. So this is negative 5 here. And then normally for the x squared function, it has two sides of this base vertex here. So let's go on the right side and sketch that out. And normally what we would do is we would, I'm going to draw it out dotted lines, we would go up like that. However, that's an extra part of the function of the x squared function that the original function didn't or doesn't have. So even though the, the equation that we have written here is x squared minus 5, it's actually kind of restricted because we got this function from the original using this inverse process. So this function here isn't exactly the same as x squared minus 5. It's actually restricted here. So we're only using positive or including 0, 0 to infinity inputs. So the inputs or the x is restricted by it has to be greater than or equal to 0. That's the restriction that we have on the inverse here. Because otherwise, it's going to include values that aren't included in the original function. And then it wouldn't be exactly the same as the inverse or as the original. So the domain of the inverse is from 0 to infinity. You can plug in starting at 0 all the way up to, to the right to positive infinity. And the range goes from negative 5 to infinity. And so... Looking at that and then comparing it with the domain and the range of the original, you might recognize that they're very similar. In fact, they're the same, but they're just well, swapped. The domain of the original is the range of the inverse. The range of the original is the domain of the inverse. So this is just to hammer in that idea that for inverse functions or inverse relations, we're swapping the x's and the y's or the inputs and the outputs. The domain becomes the range and the range becomes the domain. So let's say that the 
OG domain turns into the inverse range and the original range turns into the inverse domain. And so I think this is one of the more fundamental ideas to keep in mind is this swapping of the domain and the range. It's more so important than the individual points of the equations themselves. Because as we saw here, we got an equation, but that equation doesn't tell the whole story. The domain and the range are what's telling the whole story. So we have to keep in mind the domain and range. And I'm sure you could think of other things that we need to, to keep in mind when looking at inverse operations. So remember the parent functions, the squaring function, the square root function. We have the squaring function, f of x equals x squared. The domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is from 0, including 0, so use a bracket, to positive infinity. And then the square root function is from the domain is from 0 to infinity. And then the range is from also 0 to infinity. 0 included, so we use the bracket. And so if we're trying to, say, solve the following equations, what we're doing here, let's see, is that we first have x on the inside of the parentheses, but the parentheses are being trapped by that squared. So we want to undo the squared, so we apply the square root. And those cancel, and apply the square root here. But remember, whenever we are doing algebra and we solve for the square root, we can always get two answers, the plus or minus. So let's write out what we have here. It's x plus 2 left over is equal to plus or minus the square root of 9. The square root of 9 is 3. So then lastly, to get x by itself, we subtract 2 on both sides. And this is now where we have to look at the two different situations, the one where the three is positive and then the one where the three is negative. So on this side here, we have x is equal to positive three minus two. And on the other side here, we have x is equal to negative three minus two. And so we get one solution is one and we get the other solution is negative five. And we can actually see that on the graph. What we really did is we said y, or the output, is 9 on this x plus 2 squared function. And then the inputs associated with that output of 9 are negative 5 and 1. So negative 5 up here has that output of 9. And then 1 over here has that output also of 9. So that's what that's saying when we solve an equation is we're actually looking at the solutions of the graph at a certain height. But then for the square root function, if we're now saying that we have this square root function x plus 3 or square root of x plus 3, we're saying the output is 3, so find what's the associated input. Well, to solve for this, we need to cancel out or get rid of the square root. So we squared both sides, those cancel, square the other side. And we have here x plus 3 is equal to 9, and then get x by itself, so we subtract 3, and then what's left over after we subtract 3 on the other side is x is equal to 6 is the solution here. So this is saying when you have an output of 3, if you look at the graph 1, 2, 3, that's up here, the input is going to be 6 for x. And so when we're undoing squares, we usually get two different answers. But when we're undoing square roots, we only get one answer. And that's due to the fact that square roots and squares have a different function type or that squares are not one to one. So squares give us more than one solution. And this does pop up in other equations, like for example, the absolute value function the absolute value function is also not one to one. So when we are solving equations with the absolute value, you might remember from a previous math class, you will get more than one answer most of the time. And we can usually tell by checking to see if there are multiple solutions or to check to see if the function is one to one, different ways that we can see.